Last but not least for the day is Captain Webster. Robert is working on his PhD at uh, Beach and PhD in Galveston, correct? Or are you still with the coastal with the CMSS program? Yeah, CMSS. If you haven't noticed this poster up on the wall back over here to the far left is uh, the Coastal Marine System Science PhD program at A&M Corpus Christi. Robert's in that program. And <clears throat> he's also a, a research vessel captain. And, and I tried to get a friend of mine who told me that this is going to be a very hurricane year because he noticed sargassum coming into the uh, Corpus Christi ship channel at Port Aransas in as early as early February. And he says every time that happens, that's a sign that there's going to be early hurricane season. So I don't know. This guy was a ferry boat captain in Port Aransas. So that's, that's part of the cycle. Richard showed the picture of the jillions of hurricanes coming. So Captain West, Robert. Thank you. Like I said, my name is Robert Webster, and I'm, I'm, uh, I kind of do several different things. I, I work for a research assistant at TAMUG for uh, the Coastal Geology Lab, where we do a lot of uh, sand source studies and things of that nature. It's my kind of my real job, and then I, I do some of this stuff on, as far as my research goes. But we were asked a couple years ago by a, a homeowner's association to come in and, and uh, see what kind of role sargasm plays in, in areas between raked areas and unraked areas. And so we set up this pilot project. It's very limited in scale. Uh, it, was, it was 206, 07 season. We're now in the 07, 08 cycle. And uh, we're, I'll be collecting data probably Monday or Tuesday uh, to continue on this project. Again, Pirates Beach Bay Foundation was the sponsor for this project. And this is what they were concerned about. And, and one of the things I like to point out in this slide is you notice how narrow the beach is. Now that the, and this is not a super high tide event. This is kind of normal tide. It's just some of the places maybe have 20 meters of beach left um, before you get to the, let's see. You see the geotubes right there. And it's kind of, I'm sure you guys have been through this pretty extensively. Uh, what we kind of looked at was, you know, where the, the uh, sargasm is coming from. Uh, as you can see, it comes from the Sargasso Sea. And then it moves into the, in the Caribbean Sea here. And then as uh, the GERG representative was talking about, the, the very complex uh, sea currents, the surface currents there, moves that sargasm around. Uh, and uh, you can go to that, I believe it's the Naval website there, and uh, you can get that uh, on a live uh, every day. And, and you can, it's, it's really a very complicated system that, that moves that sargasm around during the season. Our study site was on uh, Galveston Island, kind of the mid-section of the, the island. Uh, we did a study that start at uh, Galveston State Park and a couple of the homeowners associations. And again, what we're just looking for is the influence of the sargasm and its removal on the beach morphology. What we did was take a monthly set of beach profiles from the toe of the dune out to the wet line of the beach. We did do some other things. We took some cores and uh, some grain size analysis and uh, really kind of went into a dead end on those two areas. And the results of our study, and we'll get into this a little bit of, the, of why we're at saying this, is that we didn't really find any uh, changes in beach elevation from either raked or unraked areas. Get through this. With a very limited budget, we ended up using uh, the transit system with the theodolite to, to ensure the, the lines being repetitive. And this is what we came up with for a year. Uh, this is Pirates Beach, which was a raked area, and Pirates Beach West was a non-raked area. 
And you can see there's a little bit of difference in elevation, uh, a little more that was lost in Pirate Speech than Pirate Speech West. But we'll look at this in just a moment. Here is again the, the state park where there was actually a slight accretion occurred during that year, and Beach Pocket Park, so there was some erosion. But if you look in this in more detail, you kind of see what was going on with the each site. Uh, you can see the, the June, July, and August lines here. The, uh, during the summer months, you had the sandbar migration up, up to on the beaches. And then when you get into the October and November where you start getting some of the high tides and flood tides events, those were all knocked out and come, it ends up with a kind of a winter's profile. So the bottom lines, we didn't see anything, any changes between Pirates Beach West, which was an unraked area, and Pirates Beach. Again, you can see those, even in the places where they were raked, we still had those sandbars moving up the beach. In fact, the, the, the only erosion that we really seen through the whole year was uh, occurred in the middle of October, where we had a, a major uh, tidal flood event that uh, took it down to its winter profile. Now, this is an ongoing study. We've increased the number of profile lines from 5 to 12. Uh, and we've also lengthened the lines to go to about a submeter. And the last thing, is, and it's kind of been a fun thing for me to work on, is research historical beach castings. And in going through this study, I visited with a lot of uh, BOIs, which is born on the islands for Galvestonians. And several of them made comments that, well, back in the 90s, there was no sargasm problems. And uh, back from whenever I was growing up in that area in the early 60s, all I can remember was the, the tar balls and the uh, things like that that was causing problems. I never remembered that, you know, having to deal with the sargasm on the beach. So I went to our public library, and it's, uh, they have all the newspapers on microfilm back to 1870. They also have a catalog so you can pick out a word or whatever and research that word, and, and it'll, it'll tell you the, the day that you can go to that paper and pull that up. Now, the, the problem with sargasm, though, it's been called several different things over the last 150 years. It's been called a seaweed, ironweed, gulfweed, uh, several different names, ocean mistletoe. So you had to find all those names to go back and look for it, plus some things that you probably can't say. <laughs> Well, I went back to 2007, what we just looked at, or 2004. I found articles constant from 1999 to, uh, actually they had one earlier in the, the season, complaining about the sargasm or seaweed. So in the catalog, the, the next series was 1966. So from 66 to 1999, there was not one complaint about sargasm or seaweed or whatever. But then in 1966, I had this, you know, found this article, and then I found like probably a dozen more between 1960 and 1966 where people were complaining about the park board or the city not maintaining the problem. Here's another one. This guy here says he believes that it's, you know, doing this and that. Um, it's, it's coming from the Yucatan. Uh, also that they thought that, that it was the end of the season and then about three days later another beach cast comes in and, and uh, they're faced with the dilemma of cleaning it up again. So from 1935 to 1960, again, there was nothing. No complaints, no articles, no com commentary about anything to deal with seaweed. So 1935, again, there's people complaining. And this one's kind of funny because this is Brownsville slamming at Galveston about them putting it up on barges and taking it out and then coming back on it. So I, I don't know if this uh, Augustine was, was just not, not happy with Galvestonians, but sums up with that. 
1935 starts coming again. Brownsville, they have menacing seaweed, draws requests for federal aid. And I assume back in the day before they had the bridge, it was probably more popular to go to Boca Chica than it was to go to South Padre. Uh, I don't know. But anyhow, they were fussing about wanting the federal government to come down and clean up the beaches. Kind of heard that before. Here's another one. The Galveston City Commer uh, a Department of City offered a prize of, I believe it was $10 for someone to come up with the best idea of what to deal with sargasm. The lady won it because uh, she said she put it around her pumpkins and they was able to grow extra large that way. <laughs> Here's another one in 1930. They wanted to send a, a sample to A&M College and that's, I guess, what we were called back then. Uh, for us to decide if there was any value to it. And then I guess Amy just last year came back with the results, so it only took us, you know, 80 some years to figure that out. <laughs> Again, here's another one. Same kind of thing. So from 1930 to 1936, dozens of articles in the papers, not only in Galveston, but Brownsville, San Antonio. And as we're going to see, even some further away than that. Now here's a picture in 1894, another 35-year period. So you can see the, the 1894, and as much as I've looked at sargasm, that's what that is. Here's 1889, talking about sargasm. Yeah, all the way to San Antonio. Here's another one in 1893, 1884. So again, every 35 years or so, it becomes an issue. And then you go for another 35 years and nothing. And then, you know, get back to Sheboygan, Wisconsin. In 1858, talking about the sargasm. This one here, I believe, was a sea monster that they thought was out in the in the ocean and, and uh, the captain of the ship sent his crew out there in a dinghy and I don't know if that'd be all that cool to go out there with <coughs> battle with a sea monster but, but there appears to be a pattern every 35 years or so then for about 8 to 10 years it becomes a problem then it goes away here's one in 1813 so anyhow I went back and, and uh, you know, looked at some of the research papers that had been uh, completed in the last hundred and so years. Uh, Crummel de developed that chart uh, of the boundaries of the Sargasso Sea. Uh, Parr went out in 1933 and 35 and actually did cruises and measured the, the amount of sargasm. And then back in 77 to 81, Stoner, went out and tried to duplicate that. He, he messed up a little bit, but the southwest corner of the Sargasso Sea, they have some pretty good data to compare against. And there was a significant difference between PARs and stoners. It was much less. And, and so as I put that on a uh, chart, I, well, it looked like it fits in with the uh, crummel and, and PAR went out during the high points of the sargasm periods, Stoner went out in a time that was afterwards. In fact, Stoner thought it was due to pollution that the decrease was attributed to. So then I went back and looked into, you know, some of the things that happened in the Atlantic Ocean, Gulf of Mexico, every 35 years. And what I found was the North Atlantic Oscillation Temperature Variation. And I plugged in the times and the, what Stoner and Parr had done and you notice that par during the highlight of the season, these, in between these two black lines is those highlighted episodes. Par went out there during one of those highlighted areas and then Stoner came in afterwards and could be the you know, noticeable decrease in the sargasm. 
<laughs> so it's a, it's a possibility that this is what's going on. Uh, it's still real early in my research. Uh, it is kind of coincidental that not only the in the Gulf of Mexico you had these spikes and complaints or editorials, but even out in the Atlantic Ocean you had that same kind of spike in these periods where people would complain about their ships getting stuck in the sargasm. Or, and then you'd go for 35 years and no one would have anything to say about it. Uh, with the exception in 1870 to about 79, somebody was putting seaweed in, in a, an elixir to combat them, uh, some illnesses at the time. So anyhow, the, the North Atlantic Oscillation is ba basically the, the size of the highs and the lows in the Atlantic Ocean as they kind of move around every 35 years or so. And so that's kind of what we're looking into now is if there's any correlation between the two. And uh, thanks for your time. <laughs> Questions? Yes. So if this trend continues, when is it going to die down again? And when is it going to build back up again the next time? We could be in it now. What was the question? Oh. He was asking when when would this if this in fact is something that's actually occurring where there's periods of of high uh, biomass and low biomass when would this high biomass seasons be over and when would the next time build up well according to that it's every 35 years now we look like we're working on the end of one of those zones uh, you know it could be this year it could be next year I don't know Judging by the amount of sargassum we have for our test demonstrations tomorrow, it is ended, so we're kind of... <laughs> <laughs> well, there goes our plans to use it for making methane. Yeah, well, we have 35 years ago. Yes. Did you, did you also look at letters to the editor? Um, yes, sir. Because that's what I've done. I've been looking at the, our local newspapers for a period of probably um, nearly 30 years, and I've... I had to give it up because we didn't have that electronic space to do it. But um, it's interesting to see the letters to the editor. And the mo majority of these were letters to the I editor? Did it said, said letter in the yes. And, and uh, the, the Galveston stuff I did by hand. I went in there and, and went through the microfilm. And, and because I, you learn the hard way with the seaweed and different names for that, I'd go a couple years in front and back and just going through the the microfilm until you get dizzy. Did you look and at grass? Because a lot of people call it grass. It's not grass. Yes. It grass. Yes, there's probably, I found like 30 different names for it. Wow. Some printable, some not. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you. Cool.